So it occurred to me after I said all that about the coffee church, you know, and the caffeinated church, I was thinking, you know, I don't think they used that big carafe before I was here. And then now it suddenly appeared. So it may have been an adjustment, you know, to yours truly. So uh, I don't know. I need some objective information here because it could be that I'm a little bit biased. Um, Larry, I'm just going to keep moving around, okay, so that the, the camera is meaningless. Um, <laughs> he doesn't mind. It's up to, you know, whatever. <laughs> How many real coffee fans do we have? I'm going to get some objective measurement here, okay? All right, so, all right, so at least this half of the room, half of this. And that, okay, yeah, that, that's a good 75% or more, so okay, all right. I didn't even start really drinking coffee until I worked at an office job long enough, and then it was just, you know, it became a requirement just to, you know, keep your eyes open, so... Um, Speaking of which, it was funny because um, I like it when, when Barbara leads worship, she's used to me having my eyes closed during the, while I'm playing because that's how I, 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 you know, I don't get distracted if I can just kind of close my eyes and focus. And it also allows me a nice nap because you know, before I, I get up here, then I can just kind of, I, I feel rested and refreshed. So that's what they say, you should drink ca coffee before a nap because then by the time it hits your bloodstream, you, know, you really wake up. And I think that that's you know, a good technique. So. I'm going to throw that out there for you guys to try. I think it works. I want to start off this morning with a story um, that I picked up. It says, a young couple moved into a new neighborhood. The next morning, while they were eating breakfast, the young woman saw her neighbor hanging her wash to dry. I don't know when this took place, because who still hangs their laundry out to dry? But that's OK. Um, that laundry's not very clean, she said. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. Her husband looked on, but remained silent. Every time her neighbor hung her wash out to dry, the young woman repeated her observations about the dirty laundry. About one month later, the woman was surprised to see a nice clean wash on the line and said to her husband, look, she's learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her this. The husband said, I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. <laughs> Assuming I try to use relevant stories, what might that indicate about our discussion today? There's the idea of pulling the beam out of your own eye before you criticize the speck in someone else's. So I want to talk about being friends of sinners and resisting the temptation to throw stones. Um, there's a lot of discussion in, in general media and across Christendom about how to receive different types of sinners. So I thought we would talk about this a little bit today. And I want to look at what Jesus did with quote unquote sinners. So let's start in Luke uh, chapter 7, 33 and 34. Uh, Jesus is saying, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus is building a contrast, like you're darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. But it's also giving us an interesting insight into Jesus' behavior. You don't really get to be called a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, unless you hang around with tax collectors and sinners, right? I mean, generally speaking, there's going to have to be some evidence to support this conclusion. You don't just throw that kind of stuff out there. Well, we see that Jesus actually did hang out with the people who needed spiritual nourishment, right? It's an interesting uh, commentary here from John Piper. Anyone familiar with John Piper? Very well-published uh, pastor. Um, he says, this sounds strange to us, this idea of sinners and tax collectors, uh, because we know that all people are sinners. But this phraseology, this didn't sound strange in Jesus' situation. For the Pharisees and scribes, sinners was used for a class of persons who were marked by manifestly immoral lives or questionable occupations, people that no respectable Jew would have anything to do with. So today, when we talk about sinners, we are including ourselves, I would hope. I mean, we see our, our, all of us as sinners. And that's not something that changes. That's something that happened from the fall of man. I mean, it it's just permeates our broken world. However, we have God's grace to forgive us. So when we say we are sinners, we are also saying we are forgiven and accepted by God, right? 
Well, in this context, when we talk about sinners, we're talking about a certain class of people who habitually sin in a certain way. Let's go to another chapter in Luke. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, and this is similar. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Again, remember in the culture, to eat with someone meant a certain amount of acceptance. And you and I are friends. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus approved of everything they did, does it? However, he accepted the person. He said, here is a person who could use some good news, someone who could use some unconditional love and some positive enforcement. Again, let's take a look at John 8, 2 through 11. And this is a little bit smaller. I'll read it for you. It says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? So they were using this as a question, as a trap, in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, have you heard some of the stories and different suppositions about what Jesus may have been writing? It's funny because we like to play around with these little, I wonder if, and I call that X-Files Christianity because you're never going to be able to prove it. It's really fascinating. It's kind of out there, but you're never going to have anything to really prove it. You know, there's the stories about maybe he was doodling the little fish symbol that, you know, that's like, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting that we like to dive in. But it's funny that we like to add stuff to scripture because there's so much more in there. It's like, you know what, if we actually read what's there rather than trying to add all this cool stuff, then maybe we would get something more out of it. it said, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, some people think that he was actually writing the names of the people who were willing to do the stoning because he was writing their names as sinners. Again, there's not necessarily any proof for that. It's just another idea. But he's, for whatever reason, he's just kind of writing on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. So do you see the same pattern here? There's a matter of accepting the person. Jesus is the only one who really can grant forgiveness of sins as God. However, there is this nature of, I don't hate you as a person. I don't despise you. Do not be ashamed at who you are. Do not take this to be evidence of your identity. Your behavior I don't <coughs> condone. Your behavior has no business in, in your life. However, I want you to go and just stop doing that. Now, isn't that different than the approach we tend to have today? I mean, look at what happens with some of our, uh, I was just listening to um, a, a comedian talking about American royalty and how we don't have royalty here, but we have celebrities. And some of them, we don't know why they're celebrities, they just are. And it would be breaking news if some <coughs> giant, you know, well, of course, if they passed away, you know, then it would be breaking news. But often it is huge if they make some kind of mistake or slip up. And it, it is gigantic because then it casts this negative light on one of our celebrated people. And we start to think, therefore, because they made a mistake, that shows us their character and they are therefore worth less. And we tend to do that with everyone around us. Let us mess up. And well, it was circumstances or, oh, I, oops, I, I, you know, I, I made a mistake. Let someone else mess up. Whoa, there is a character flaw. There is something that that person needs to fix. There is something wrong with their relationship with Jesus. I can see it from here. But no, when it happens to us, 
it's just a little passing issue. God will forgive me for that. You see how we, we do this? We tend to impute value to people, and that's what Jesus didn't do. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about what I sent out in an email this week. And uh, I'm kind of leading up to this because this is what brought attention to the idea. Um, I said when we're looking at our logos, I said I want to append our new logos with the idea, a church where everyone is included. And when I sent the email, I said, though these designs don't all include it, the final choice will be appended with the tagline, a church where everyone's included. This addresses any ambiguity over whether or not we're a church and shows our posture of serving the community and accepting everyone with the love of Christ. Now, I mentioned that about us being a church because I think as we've discussed before, there's, there are a lot of people in the colony who don't even know that we are a church. They think that we're just you know, a group, a social group or something because the word is fellowship. And so to us, as people you know, steeped in church culture, uh, we may think, well, what else is fellowship gonna mean? <laughs> but that doesn't read the same way to everyone, right? So the interesting thing about this is that it's a matter of perspective. Like I said, I perceive that this is a coffee-loving church, but that's from a coffee-loving person. So my, my perspective is perhaps a little biased. But a number of people mentioned to me, I don't know if this is something that we want, because it could be interpreted differently than the way you mean it. And I think that there's a valid point there. Because a church where everyone is included could be taken to mean that we are like other churches who now embrace alternative lifestyles. Now, that's not the way I intended it. I think we're all pretty clear on the intent, right? I mean, in the context of what we're talking about with Jesus, we want everyone to be included and to know that they are loved by Christ. On the other hand, I don't want people to interpret it to mean that we are politically in favor or of a particular lifestyle. So with that in mind, I'm okay with not including this. I'm okay with not including a church where everyone is included. I mean, I believe that you know, God speaks through individuals, God speaks through a church. This is not paramount to me. But while we're on the subject, I thought it would be good to review, well, what do we think about some of these alternative lifestyles? And lest there be any kind of confusion, I wanted to present our stance or, or our statement on how we feel about these alternative lifestyles and homosexuality. And I know this is by way of uh, a reminder for most, but I just want to throw it out there. And I know it gets really serious, but sometimes you just have to talk about doctrine. So again, this is kind of small, so I'll read it to you. This is from our denomination's uh, website. This is the official GCI position on homosexuality. It says, the Bible teaches that the practice of homosexual behavior is a sin as indicated by biblical prohibitions such as Romans 1, 26 and 27 and 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And we'll look at those in a second. However, homosexual behavior is no more or less sinful than any other sin. Can we be in agreement about that? So again, when Jesus says to someone, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more, there is acceptance of the person and not the behavior. And this is what we're saying here. Homosexual behavior is no more or less sinful than any other sin. All sinners, which means all of us, are called to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Any sinner who comes to Christ finds repentance and forgiveness and is cleansed by the Holy Spirit of all his or her sins. So let's take a look at these scriptures here. Romans 1, 26 and 27. Now, well, actually, before I do that, I want to share my journey toward seeing things in this way doctrinally. Uh, I said to a pastor many years ago, I said, you know, I'm not sure I agree with this stance because there seems to be a lot of evidence, you know, people talk about being genetically born in a way that predisposes them to certain behavior. And, you know, maybe we just don't see it correctly. Maybe this is something that was cultural. You know, I'm not so sure about this. And he said something to me that made a whole lot of sense. He said, you know what, I would think the same way, except throughout the Bible, throughout scripture, when there is a list of sins that God does not, I want to say doesn't like, but that's kind of silly and obvious, right? When there is a sin list in the Bible, often homosexuality is there. So it's not as if it was a one-off, like when, uh, when Paul talks about let your women remain silent, you know? That is something that involved a lot of cultural stuff, and we often misinterpret it 
and we can go into that another time, but that was more of a cultural issue that we see. And in fact, he was saying just remain silent in this context, but that doesn't mean always. So again, we'll get into that again, but homosexuality is con consistently mentioned in lists of things that God does not love. So Romans 1, 26 and 27, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, in the same way the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So it's pretty clear here to us in our understanding of this scripture that it is not something that is okay. Now, just like any individual part of scripture, if you get enough people to comment on it and weigh on it, you will hear many different arguments. Now, what I appreciate is that our denomination has looked at those discussions, dug into the scripture, and said, was this a cultural thing? Well, we don't think so. And along with the National Association of Evangelicals, they've had conferences on it, there's been a lot of discussion, and this is a matter of, look, we understand the alternative arguments, but to us, this seems to be the way that scripture is leaning. You dig into the original languages, you dig into the context, and it does seem pretty clear. So this was the other scripture that was mentioned, 1 Corinthians 6, 7 through 11. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. See what I mean with these sin lists? There's a bunch of stuff in there, and that's one of them. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My point is made right here in the middle here. While we may focus as a society and in media on this part about idolaters of, or, nor men who have sex with men, blah, 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 here's the part we tend to gloss over. Slanderers, right there. What's a slanderer about someone who insults and disparages someone else? So again, how would Jesus respond to someone engaging in this kind of activity? Hate the sin and love the sinner. So from my perspective, if someone comes up to me and they're obviously in a homosexual relationship, I want them to feel respected. They are of no less value than anyone else. If we start disrespecting and mistreating other people because of their sins, then we are giant hypocrites because all of us would be do the same disrespect because we are all sinners. We are all in the same boat. We are all covered by God's grace. So the point here is not that if we had some kind of a logo or a, a tagline like that, and like I said, I'm fine with removing that. I mean, I, I hear you. The point is, I would want us to be a church regardless that respects everyone. And I think we are. I think we're a body that can respect anybody. The funny thing is that we have our preferences. I mean, I like my coffee the way I like my coffee. And you know, often couples will say, I know how my husband or my wife likes their coffee. Well, we have our preferences. And it's funny because as a society, we've developed our preferences and what we turn a blind eye to. It's funny, I would bet most of us heterosexual people wouldn't flinch at a movie or TV depiction of a couple engaging in sex outside of marriage because we're used to it. However, turn that into a same-sex couple, and I bet more than one of us would be like, I don't want to see that. Well, they're both sin. And so my point just being that it's not a matter of saying, okay, you're worse than the others because that's a little bit more natural. There's this messed up thinking. Remember a while ago I was talking about how we think and we can't trust it? Sin is sin is sin. So we cannot say to anyone, you're worse than me because you're sinning in a different way. So the idea is acceptance. 
Does that make some amount of sense here? I, I hate going into something this serious. I love to just joke around, but I mean, sometimes you gotta cover doctrine and you know, say, okay, well, where do we stand? And so we've talked about this in the, we're gonna move on to our logos in just a minute. Some of our logos were pretty colorful. Lots of pretty rainbow colors. And people said, I don't know about that. And I said, oh, come on, they're colors. I'm tired of colors being associated with political movements or you know, alternative lifestyles. Why can't we embrace the rainbow? It's good for cereal. It's good for us. But I get it. And you know what? I was looking at a couple of websites in uh, preparation for this message. And it was funny because other people who interpret these same script scriptures very differently, and I don't agree with them. Um, often they would go off and interpret some other scripture in completely the wrong way, showing that their, their viewpoint on how to interpret the words of Christ it, it was questionable. But anyway, one of these websites said, join us in accepting this as a natural lifestyle. And they had this whole list of churches around the country or groups um, that had broken off of churches and their logos that were indicating their acceptance of alternative lifestyles. And often they would have that rainbow color effect. And so I get it. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't want to send the wrong message. I also don't ever want to send the message to any individual that you are worthless or that you are due of less respect or that you are any less precious in the eyes of God because of your particular sin. It's a matter of who we are in Christ, it's our identity, not sexuality, not sinfulness. Those are behaviors, and we are not our behavior. We get our identity in Christ. So, with all of that, <laughs> I hope that makes some sense. With all of that, I do want to finally go ahead, and we've been talking about our logos, we've been talking about how we want to be represented. Like I said, the way you depict yourself in an image makes a big difference. You ever notice people don't typically put their selfies online when they just woke up in the morning? <laughs> Not with their hair all wild and their eyes all bugged out and you know their pajamas or whatever. You know, it's a matter of you try to look your best. So as we approach the community, then I want us to have something that we can be known by. Every church has some kind of a, an, an image. And uh, often they do have a tagline, and we can work on that together. That doesn't matter so much to me at the moment. Some some churches take a phrase as part of who they are in terms of their role in the body of Christ. I mean, they might choose an airport image and say, we help people get where they're going in their walk with Jesus. And they just, you know, they come through and we assist them. And then when they go on to something else, that's what we do. So we're a part of it. So there's some beauty in that. But anyway, what I want is I refuse to be a church where one person makes all the decisions. So what we did was out of lots and lots of pictures, I got a couple of groups of people together. And so we kind of widowed it down. And I said, okay, let's see. Um, I think this is the, our group consensus that these are the ones that we can kind of qualify. These are our American Idol finalists, okay? <laughs> so this is what we're gonna do. Uh, we'll go ahead and choose from these. Um, there was a book that I read that talked about how you have to narrow down choice or we get overwhelmed, okay? I keep coming back to coffee. I love nice insulated coffee mugs. I went to Kroger one time and found that they had a whole display rack, like dozens of coffee mugs of all different kinds. And I couldn't decide. And they were all on sale. I was like, I like that one, and I like that one, and I like that one. Well, this one's cheaper, but that one holds more. Well, this one goes in the microwave, but that one, uh, that one just looks cool. And I just like had all of these choices. And it's been studied. If you want to open a, a jam and jelly company, and you go into a supermarket and do a test where you say, OK, what flavors do people like? If you put out 48 flavors, you're not going to get any kind of answer. You put out three and you'll find out pretty quickly what people like because we get overwhelmed. So with that in mind, I'm gonna present <laughs> our finalists today. This is option number one. Drum roll. <laughs> I do my drum rolls before the sermon. Uh, this is option number one. I, I feel like I shouldn't really say anything because I don't wanna sway anyone's vote, but um, these are, I, I like the colors. I think it looks good. Uh, we tweaked it a little bit. This is a, a, a revision of a revision. Um, this is one, sorry if I'm standing in anybody's way. Um, but so this is option one, and at the end, you know, I'll, I'll show you a slide with all of them on there. So take a look at this. And we'll move to option two. 
The idea of that is the sunrise. We went through earlier versions that looked more like the Good Morning America logo. And we said, well, you know, we might run into a lawsuit there. So this is number two. This is number three. Is it pretty clear to everyone that those are hands? Mm -hmm. I had no clue what, that, what those were. Yeah, yeah. And so if it's going to be on something small print, it might mm -hmm. be hard for people to know. Understood, understood. Yeah. Are those the colors, or are we going to? Considering how long it's taken us to get to this level, I'm <laughs> thinking that we're going to stick with the colors, yeah. Yeah. And so this next one is a variation, OK? Um, there were some concerns that people said, well, I'm not quite sure what that is behind the cross there. Um, what if we had it look like a flame? So I asked the company that did it for us, would you give us a flame? So this is basically the same thing. I did ask them to accentuate the fingers, make it more obvious that it was a hand or hands, and uh, that way it would be visible, like you said, you know, if it's going to be small um, to be visible. Now, I'm just going to not say anything because I've got you know thoughts either way on all of these things. What I would like is for everyone's opinion, and um, I really hope that it's not going to be 25%, 25%, 25%, and 25%. So I hope this is something that you've prayed about and something that you know um, that there will be some kind of consensus. Um, would you mind just taking one and passing it down? Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to leave this up here for a bit, and these are the options. And all I want you to do is take one of these slips of paper and just put down the number that you like. Now, um, Ryan phoned in his vote, so <laughs> I'm good with him. Uh, I would like just one vote per person. Uh, what I really hope is that we have, a, like I said, a consensus. So take a look at these and see what you think. Yes, sir. Yeah, the idea that I, I'll say that to clarify, number one, that they are people coming out from a central point to serve. And, and um, so there's, there's two arms and a head, and there's the four uh, dark ones that are assembled in the, the rough shape of a cross. And then the green ones just kind of fill in for artistic reasons. So it's a cross, and it's people reaching out into the community. We hope community fellowship. That was basically the guidance that I gave to the different artists was that, look, this is who we are. This is what we're about. We like to reach into the community. We like to connect. If you want to show people holding hands or whatever, I, I really just let them go with it because I've previously had too much influence on our artists and said, this is what I'm looking for, and it didn't go well. So. And if we can get a volunteer to come around with uh, one of the offering baskets, maybe, and just uh, take up the little slips of paper, that'd be great. So of course, you're going to need to give me a little bit of time to, to, uh, to tally them up. <laughs> <laughs> Don's been such a fan of this process. He's just happy to take up all the votes. <laughs> so
So like I said earlier today um, in the uh, discipleship class that it would come back around this discussion of God speaking through the church. Um, I really like us to have a model of church governance where we all have a say. I think that we are all, you know, we're all Christians. We worship the same God. We can hear the same message from God. I don't believe that out of 50 people, he will whisper 50 different things in each of our ears. So I think there's a lot of wisdom to getting together and saying, okay, this is what I believe in and this is what I think. Now, in this particular instance, it's going to be a matter of preference. You know, I like this color scheme. I like this shape better. That's fine. But as a church, I do believe that we have a calling to function together as a unit, and we get to participate as a family. So I don't want it to be a matter of any one person deciding this is the way it's going to be. So um, I think that that is part of us being one in the body of Christ, and we have the communion to remind us of the body of Christ. There's a, a, there's a literal body of Christ that represents all of us. And like we talked about this morning, again, in the discipleship class, the body is made up of many different parts. You've got your hands and feet, you've got the mind, you've got eyes and ears, and all of us can get to serve a different function. And really, you can read scripture to mean that we are the body of Christ, even just in this room, we are complete in a way. And that whatever parts or skills we lack, that's okay because we may not be called to do anything else but what we already have here. And I believe God will equip you to do as a church whatever, uh, whatever he has for you. So he's given each of us here for a reason. So I appreciate that you're here and I'm glad that we can partake of the body and blood of Christ together. So will you pray with me? Father, we ask for, in a sense, your, your blessing on the elements, but they're just, it's just bread and wine. Um, Father, rather we ask for your blessing on our hearts and minds that, that we would truly see ourselves, our core identity, who we are, as your beloved children, as members of your family, fully adopted, inseparable, that we would find our identity, who we are in you, and that we can rest in that and have peace. Father, as part of your family, we pray that you would speak clearly to us and give us the eyes and ears to receive whatever messages you have for us. And Father, give us the mouths to share what we hear from you. Father, I thank you that you've given us a body that is complete with you and that you will provide for whatever needs we have. We ask for your blessing on, on this, the sacrament of the the bread and the wine to remind us of Jesus' shed blood and his broken body for us. Father, we thank you for it and ask your blessing in his name. Amen. We have juice in the center if you'd like to participate and um, bread here if you'll come up and take the elements and take them back to your seat, then we'll all partake together.